Hey skiers, welcome to the latest episode of the Big Picture Skiing Podcast. On today's show, you're going to meet a man named Stephen Fearing. Stephen Fearing is a top level mogul coach. And I mean top, he's coached Olympic gold medalists and world champions to glory. So this guy knows about moguls. Now I wanted to make this interview particularly sort of informative and have a lot of takeaways. So before the show, I said to Stephen, hey, the, the kind of the pitch of this show is imagine you were tasked with being like head of World Moguls Association. And this year you were trying to get more people involved in moguls. And so you're speaking to people that don't really like moguls, people that love moguls, people that are maybe tentative getting into it. So I tried to gear the questions around getting information that would really inspire you, inform you on being able to make like better decisions about how you're going to approach your moguls, whether that's equipment or technique or tactics. And I think it's a really interesting approach because, I mean, you're hearing from like a guy who knows a lot. Part of doing this podcast is I'm always thirsty to learn more about skiing stuff. And in this one, I definitely learned a few things I didn't really know, or it helped me understand and clarify some things I'm working on in my own mogul skiing even further. So I really think whether you are an avid mogul skier or whether you're sort of tentative or not sure about getting into it, I think you're going to get something really good out of this episode. Stephen was joining us from the country of Georgia and he was over the road at a hotel. And so sometimes the audio, the background, there might be a bit of noise and I apologize for that, but I think we're just really lucky to hear from someone of his caliber. Finally, just before we jump into this episode, if you haven't yet, Big Picture Skiing is my project. It's my thing. It's, it's how I try and share my instructional knowledge, my coaching knowledge, everything I learn through podcasts like this and my own tinkering and understanding of, of progressing people into better skiers put all that into video content along with my co-coach Sam and we successfully teach people we're getting great results people are really enjoying it just the other day a guy who's more an intermediate level he tested out one of the drills in the drills and exercises category and he said far out he could not believe how much of a difference he made just working on that one drill that was explained and by the end of the day he said he'd never had uh, as much control as much symmetry in his uh, skis and as much sort of confidence to go into steeper terrain. So all that through just a video. So I encourage you to check it out. And just from listening to this show, I'm going to offer you a coupon code, which is PODCAST, all in capitals. If you put that in, you'll get 25% off any subscription choice you like. So if you want to find out more, head to bigpictureskiing.com. Hopefully you'll get some results just like our friend I mentioned before. Without further ado, here is Stephen Fearing talking about moguls. If we were in this imaginary environment or the world was, they chose you as the person that was tasked with making moguls boom. More people around the world love moguls, enjoy it, find it fun. If people are going to get into moguls and this is the season they're going to, try and enjoy them. Would you start with technique stuff or would you start with discussing some stuff like equipment choices? Well, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a good question because, you know, um, obviously uh, the width of the ski is really important to feel um, that you're, you're agile. You can be quick edge to edge. Um, the wider skis, you just, it takes more time to, to kind of develop the transition and to return. But uh, that being said, you know, I've skied all kinds of skis through natural moguls, um, crud moguls, uh, you know, piste, uh, off piece gets skied up and you, you start to get moguls developing, especially in, in uh, lift accessible off piece, like in Whistler has quite a bit. So, you know, when you have, mm, definitely the equipment can make it easier. Um, but there's, so a, let's there's do, a technical things. Okay. Well, let's let's start there because it's you, you definitely brought up the the narrow ski thing because today's trend is 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 generally wider skis. Yeah. So a good tip if someone was going to really make this their mobile season, go something a little narrower and and like what sort of ski even even lengthwise would you say if they if they're confident you know they can ski pretty well the groomers but but the moguls are like oh, they don't really choose that area 
what's a good ski? Uh, in general, I would I would stick to a one eighty. Um, I know competitors are going shorter, like 77, 72, but I, I would stay over the 180 mark. Um, then that would you know, be based on weight, uh, uh, you know, physical strength. You know, you could probably go a little bit longer, but I, 180 seems to be the most well-rounded length for, for what I, I've seen. Uh, the, the width of a ski, um, and as you said, it's just really difficult to find something in, in, the, in the waist that's less than 75. Uh, you know, you get those, those uh, wide waist. And so what happens is it just takes so long for you to get kind of from that edge flat. To get, it's a long transition. And the, the long transition is probably where you get that you know, over speed feeling because you want your transitions to be as quick as possible so that you're spending more time on the, on the flex and the edge of the ski. Uh, so, you know, there are some um, all mountain skis that you, you can find a, a thinner waist. Those will just allow you, you know, they won't be as great as, as, as the, the wide base for powder skiing, but it'll be something that when it gets skied up a bit, Pretty. I've enjoyed the uh, powder in, in a narrow way ski. Um, and as it gets skied out, you just have more opportunity to ski different ways uh, through, through different different pitches and off piece. So it's good. Yeah. And what about, so when you're mentioning that, that 180 length, so say maybe we're talking about guys there, uh, like what are people going to feel between a longer ski versus going shorter like what's what advantages would you feel actually having that little bit longer length when you get into the bumps um definitely for me it's a four and a half balance because uh even in a, a free ski situation you're gonna want to have a, a little bit more of a, a tip contact you know never straight down the pond but there's different places on the mogul you can have that tip contact and i i think people um, and the short ski, you'll find as the, the tip of the ski on a short ski gets flexed, it gives a real difficult fore and aft balance situation. The longer flex will just give you a smoother, kind of a wider base to, to stay balanced, not horizontally, uh, kind of down front the to head. back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, front to back vertical. Yeah, so I, that's, I know I've... That, that's my position. Yeah. And I know I've, I've felt that and it was kind of surprising and counterintuitive first because you think taking a longer ski is going to make it more difficult. But if you have the right approach, a longer tip kind of interacts with the next mogul sooner and can actually make you feel like you get control sooner. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, um, you, you talked a little bit before we started the broadcast about you know, trampolines and et cetera. And it's, it's like if you get a wider, like a super tramp, and the bounce and the flex is so smooth, the bigger the trampoline. And then you get the small trampolines like you, you see in the, the 70s workouts and, and they're yeah. just a little bit more you know, erratic off, kind off of feeling. Filter, erratic, yeah, you just get thrown around. So That's it's a kind good of analogy. the same feeling of, of, of the ski flex. The, just the more base foundation you have it gives more leeway for you to you know to have a i'll call it a wider center of gravity because your base will just feel more controlled without getting pushed around erratically yeah and so if you were to say like say for for for, for ladies listening like a longer ski for them is probably encouraging them to go like into 170 kind of area is that is would that be yeah. correct yeah, I would I would say uh, 170, but I I would even say a strong skier. You know, they can Len and one can stick around that uh, 180 mark. You know, maybe not go to 180, but 175. Um, cool, etc. Yeah, and it just feels better at high speed too. You know, you, you yeah. just find more stability because you're not just going to get a ski just for mobile. So, kind of rods. Your, your opportunity to use a ski in a, a multi-conditional 
situation. And then <clears throat> the side cut, because I remember we had we had a chat uh, sort of around the COVID period, just uh, you and I, but <clears throat> I was talking to you about skiing slalom skis and more shaped skis in moguls. And that definitely comes with its own challenges. So would you have any kind of advice around choosing, yeah, the, the radius and side cut in a ski? Yeah, well, there, again, there's limited choices, but definitely for mogul, the bend of the ski and the bend with the edge combined, that's where we kind of develop this, you know, the, the side cut or the shape. So if it has too much side cut, so extreme in, you know, tip and tail, if you put the ski in, it's going to get kind of an over, as the ski flexes into the face of the model, it's going to get that, that over arc. And it's just, it's really difficult to control uh, the ski to stay under you because it'll just over flex and then it'll go left and right, uh, east and west too much. So it's yeah uh, trying to find a ski that doesn't have a big difference and it's it's something that you know if you can stay within um you know kind of the the like high idea teens that, high teens yeah. like, you know like an 18 meter like what is it what's a perfect what's a proper mogul ski like your id ones that you have like what are they radius wise well, I mean, it's funny because a lot of the European com countries I'm going up kind of off on this, but uh, they use a, a, a junior GS ski as kind of the foundation for their ski. Um, so, you know, this, as you work in the slalom ski, it has much of that, much more of that radical cut. So the junior, um, and I think they just choose the, the junior structure because of the, the length. You know, you're not going to find an adult ski. Um, but, you know, with the, the ID1, um, it, in today's, I, I would say, world of skis, and if someone's walking into a ski shop and they see an ID1 on the wall, they're not really going to see kind of the shape. You really have to look closely to kind of <laughs> see that, that mild, that mild, uh, shape but it was very important for us to have that in there even it looks like a 70s straight ski there, there is shape to it it's just uh, le less pronounced and it's it's easy to you know to use more flex of the ski to to kind of get that radius of the ski work important yeah and i should say for people that, that don't know like what you're you're talking there about id1 it's you actually helped create this company which is a mogul specific ski brand company and so that's why it's great you get, you're giving insight into what you know if, if people professionally skiing moguls and only skiing moguls are choosing a ski with certain characteristics that's why you're also suggesting like if you're going to get a sort of an all-rounder steering a little towards longer length narrow underfoot a little less shape they're all going to help you now maybe if we well maybe we'll come back to boots and stuff later but if we think about those characteristics in the ski into technique say uh because i know you've talked about like like part of control is speed control is turning which i think every skier have done a bit they know you turn you slow down i don't think a lot of people realize that, that the absorption is is a big factor uh how much is the absorption a factor of speed control yeah well it's you know it well you look at it as you know you're contouring um and so let's say you have a, a flat course of 200 meters and then you have 200 meters of moguls and you ran a rope along each one and you pulled the rope straight the length of the rope would be different. So the idea is to use kind of that mobile contour um, to actually spend more time in, in the present or in the place that you're at. So as I said, Tom, if, if you're not having the correct absorption, extension time, things will get out of um, sync. You're not following the rope. The accelerator, 
yeah you, you're going yeah, down that the t- yeah okay okay yeah and so, so, I, so that you, know, you go ahead sorry go ahead no so I, I the idea is i like to take the head shoulder and the in the pelvis and you when you look at that kind of let's say that um, imaginary plane that like that flat mind plane and you lift it to the top of the top of the mobile so i'm certain my hands are out there but up to the top yeah. of the what the mobile is almost like when, body when you have a have a rope down the side of a roped off mogul run that rope yeah. line is almost like shoulder height yeah uh, no i would say i'd like to take the example of uh, the top of the mogul the crown okay the top of the mogul okay there yep so so i use that as kind of where my you know my base foundation thought and what i try to do is i will try to get my head shoulders and my pelvis never to change distance on this line because it's it's the the flat line you take out away the trough you take away the face and the backside of the mogul so i'd never want those three points or the upper torso including the pelvis to go up and down on that line i want it to be consistent the whole way that makes sense to you yeah it's uh, yeah trying to keep that level that level of position a lot of people will let's say in the absorption phase they'll drop the pelvis lower than the top of the mogul or they'll be at the top of the mogul and they'll lift the pelvis uh, above higher than the, the top point so you know each person you, I, you know they'd like to think about different things i use the three checkpoints maybe not all three at the same time but it's is my head level shoulder level is my pelvis level is it staying on that that consistent plane mm-hmm. and so so with that like that speed control thing and i guess you trying to bring the world into like enjoying moguls more would one of the biggest like areas people wanting to enjoy moguls need to improve be absorption would you say that's probably the weakest skill or is there another one what would you put there um, as the i put absorption and extension into one basket and you can't really have one without the other um, I would say neutral position is where people get confused. Um, like they overabsorb or they absorb with no tension. So they kind of collapse and they end up sitting on, you know, kind of s- sitting the position instead of letting the mogul and the skis kind of press and, and move the legs, you know, the quads and the hip flexors up. People just tend to drop into a low position. Um, extension um it's a lot a lot of people because they get nervous they'll overextend so they'll kind of create a brace and overextended position um and they do it early because the faster they do it the more safe they feel so in the absorb phase you gotta have tension on i'll call it tension um and of, of course the alignment making sure that the feet are under the hip the knees are in front of the toes and letting the mogul and the ski push your absorption upward opposed to you sinking into absorption. Because Second back point, to your back to your right. like line down the moguls. Now you've just stuffed up your following, not letting the pelvis drop and the, everything drop below that that line. So so big factor, people people absorb and sink their bum low in that line. Main main kind of issue. Okay, cool. Then second factor. Second point. So you got the, the crown, the, the crown or the top, um, cause ruts change. And so you, it's, it's never a, a straightforward, um, flat point, the top, depending on where you go through, could be at different levels. And so if you, when you go through that crown phase, people tend to extend, um, very rapidly and quickly to try to get into a braced position and you need to just have a patient kind of uh, it's like you stall yourself you wait till your your heel of your boot passes that high point and then you start extending but you don't 
extend with so much force or extend with so much aggression or you know it can't be like a, a quick uh, it has to be kind of a kind of a like a, a like you're pressing um you know not, not like hitting the mogul but you're kind of pressing the mogul and it, it has to be kind of in, in a gauge you know kind of one two three four instead of what if, everything at one time so to be like the equivalent of like you, the movement shouldn't create if you're off the moguls it shouldn't create you kind of unweighting or doing almost like a slight jump it should be like you coming up slowly out of a out of a squat that right. doesn't unweight you right right and then i would say it it's more like um an inverted squat like the legs pressing away from you not kind of a squat where you're kind of lifting the hip it's more of weighing to the back side and, and pressing so if you're in the down pressing. into like negative space so like our leg press uh, uh, leg press upside down <laughs> yeah yes yes okay is there is there some kind of device you've ever used or invented for dry land training to to do that to help athletes no well i there is an invention out there i, I know the u.s ski team utilizes it for their their alpine and mobile skiers um you know we'll have to put it in the comments later because i had to send it to you at the name but it has a it's basically a tension so you you stand on this apparatus and it gives tension both ways so it, it kind of has that effect um but it's it has not direct weights but it has a, a tension um it's so, 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 yeah we can yeah it okay it's not no, like like almost like a you're sort of standing on a spring that has resistance in a way and so you push down and it has a bit of resistance but it goes down and then it pushes you back with the resistance so yeah so you have the center base center you have to control both sides yeah do you think it's effective like does it give the same feeling to yeah you? Yeah, you know, I I know that the Alpine team, especially the Slime Skiers, have had success, and it seems the Mobile Skiers are having a great year. And um, I don't think it's a piece of equipment you can find <laughs> quite uh, quite easily. But um, that being said, I, I think a lot of things of combining training. You know, some people just get to the gym and they. Uh, any gym will work, you know, you, you just have to make sure that when you're doing your legs day, you're just not doing, um, let's say, a squat. You're, you're doing, you know, a hack squat, squat, leg press, and kind of a cycle so that you're getting all different, you know, tensions and, and um, flexion of the muscle and you're yeah. utilizing all directions. And bands, yep. bands are another great thing. You know, you just, you know, we use a lot of bands, especially in Canada. You can pro probably look up, and Kingsbury has like a recent video from the beginning of December where he uses the bands, which is quite common in Canada, using uh, uh, a lot of jump technique where you're pressing um, tension bands. Bands, um, yeah. So you get. So you get resistance both both ways. So it's kind of like a poor man version of what I'm describing at the US ski team yeah. has <laughs> yeah. training center. It, it does make sense though, like if if the feeling of extension in the moguls is not like a squat in a way, because you 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 don't want your hips to really be rising, you're trying to press your feet sort of down and follow the trough. It's why probably it's hard, like you know, we always learn by having something that we can relate to. Um, and so why it probably takes just some practice of, you know, breaking it down. So, you know, if you had uh, your your army of, of mogul ski instructors, would you get them like as part of their progression for teaching extension to, to make people, like make, make them teach their guests to do this slowly, like really get the, like work on guests, getting this slower extension, like stand on the top of a mogul, in a flex position and then practice the time of extension over and over until they like kept the hips level yeah. of the, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and we, a lot of times we'll, we'll build, we call them the rollers or the wings. And it's not a, just for absorption. It's actually using uh, timing of the absorption extension and turn kind of in a combination. It's just a lot easier in a wave because you have that, that constant same direction uh, top of the mogul opposed to a rut where it might be angled at different directions. So it's hard to sometimes feel that. Yeah, so you take away that the angle part and suddenly you can now just yeah. work more easily on, on just a straight up and down down movement it's a shame not like more resorts have those available like i guess now you're chief of like getting moguls more popular that's what you do you'd get every resort to build a public mogul tank right like approved yeah you know it's in <laughs> in, Aust in austria this this um uh, this october um, basically for six weeks in hamper tucks uh, we We've gotten a good connection with them and, and you know, we've put out you know, a public mogul lane, um, uh, kind of a, a, a easier, let's say, kind of um, sports gear lane. And then we had kind of that fist competition lane. And that was one of the ideas. And they're all into it is trying to have us build different training venues for the public so it, it is in the plan to do that in the future yeah cool yeah i know i i just think if you can break something down take away like you said some of the trickier parts it's you can make a lot of progress uh fast now uh if we went like back a step and so talked about turning just the turning factor what do you see as like the main mistakes people do when they turn or try and yeah make make that turn shape in the moguls um well as as recent and i think it is probably simplified in, this, in the sense that um, the way people look at you know the front of the ski um i i like to break it down as you have the inside front you have the nose or the the nose of the tip and then the outside. And there's, especially in natural models, there's different entry points to a mogul. It doesn't always have to be in the front of the mogul. It can be on the side of the mogul, low on the side of the mogul. There's, you know, thousands of variables in, in kind of where you enter a mogul. But it's the nose of the tip and where that enters. And again, it doesn't have to be let's say from the front straight into the fall line because you know that that's hard for a lot of people to and I have the confidence but if even if I'm coming in and I have my turn and I'm coming into the side of the mogul I want that nose point really kind of stabbing or directing into where I'm entering the mogul so I, I like to use that uh, even in, in coaching with competitors is you know they like to tend to use they think, oh, we're, I'm using the tip, but it's the outside point of the tip. Uh, it's, you know, the, the, the tip it's of the not ski, the but actual... the side of the tip. Yeah, the okay, nose. yeah, yeah. They're thinking about like so, the same as like a slalom ski would think the tip, that it's, it's the side cut edge part. You're actually referring to yeah. the very front, which most people never <laughs> ski on, right? But you're like, you want to encourage yeah. that part and people to think of that part of the ski where it's going into the bump. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the nose of the tip, and and practice entering all all points of the mogul. Uh, a natural mogul, you know, can sometimes be five meters, ten meters, twelve, twenty meters in, in length. So you can enter a mogul in multiple um, points, um, multi direction, and and that just gives you kind of a better understanding of how the ski works and you can do it at different comfort levels because if i have a natural mole and i come in with the nose at the side it's way less intimidating than coming in to the top side front of, of the fall line with the nose in the ski. So, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i must say after our last chat we talked uh about like coming into a bump these different entry points 
like a low line and a high line where you are sort of entering that, that next bump. And the thing I think I realized I wasn't doing enough of or fluked sometimes was taking a high line, not always trying to avoid the high line and the high line almost, it actually is the slower because I mean, of course you're extending that piece of rope that's going up and down. You, you aim for that exactly. one, which is the scary one is actually the not scary line because you go slower and the, and the one that you want to most people aim for the low one that's the one you start going boom, 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 really exactly. fast on so I'm, i must say like that was uh that was huge and i had some success coaching some other people like skiing into the more intimidating part of the bump instead of the less like where everyone else goes and that's why there's a, a rut line yeah and um- even snow conditions. So you, you talk about that rut line and it looks like it's less intimidating because it's smoother, but that soft powdery snow or even that slushy spring and summer snow, putting your tips into that is so comforting to kind of control your speed and, and catch your body position because you, you just kind of st- stay in that, in that skied out line and it's... It, you have to rely more on, you know, being technically and timing perfect. Yes. Yeah. So then the, what, what uh, comes to my mind is like, I know pivot slips is a, like a, a place. A lot of people start a progression, like say with kids, even getting into bumps um, comments on, on, on pivot slips into bumps yeah no that's definitely a, a let's say a, an exercise you know it's not something that i would you know spend a full day on but i would probably put it into the kind of the, the let's say the structure of progression up and exercise yeah but i wouldn't spend too much time on it and i would not i, I probably wouldn't take a, a beginner and I'm not talking about a mobile beginner, but you know, I'd, I'd say an upper intermediate that could be effective as kind of a, a, a skill. But in a lower level skier, it might just end up um, kind of taking away the, the understanding of the technical um, way of skiing. So you know, I think you have to wait to your upper intermediate to kind of use that that pivot slip without this this understanding of what the, the purpose of the exercise and the goal of what you're doing. And that's a lot of things I see with coaches and, and, and let's say they they know how to tell people um, what exercise and how to do it, but they have to understand it's, it's like a, you just don't prescribe it and then walk away. It's not like they're going to take that medicine and come back better. It's more of like a, a therapy the exercise of, you know, using, um, you have to pay attention to what they're doing during that exercise in detail because just because they do it 10 times is not going to get the benefit of what they need to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's certain things like that you can really get out of that, but you need to be, if you're coaching, make sure, you're getting the student to realize those things. Hey, feel what this drill is giving you. Like that's the element we're going to take into our free skiing after the drill. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Talked about absorption extension, some yeah. turning, uh, a little bit about line. What about pole planning? What do you think? Uh, like how important is it to, for people to spend time like actually working on the pole plant part? Pole plants are very important. Um, you have to understand, um, I, I would say in the transition phase, and I, we, we talked about that before, in, in the transition of going from an edge ski to the flat ski, kind of the transfer. It's a, a very small, I call it a box. Um, and whatever direction your turn is finished, that box is facing that direction. And people, you know, when when they, when they're skiing moguls, their tendency is to plant at the wrong time. Like your plant should be end of turn before transition. 
and it has to be in a mobile. Um, generally, it has to be a very short transition and very quick, quickly turned. Um, but you know, it's it's it, looking at um, you know ski instructors or let's say sports skiers or free skiers. Um, if you see an imbalance of their pull plan so many times, it's like, are they planning at what phase of the turn is the correct point of the turn? Um, and then let's say the big mountain turn, you have kind of that longer you know, shape of turn. Um, so you, everything can be longer from the initiation to the end and the transition obviously can be you know, meters long, but in a, in a mobile, you really want to keep your transitions on I would say in under 20, 20 to 30 centimeters. Um, cool. That's how quick your transition needs to be. That's how true. So in that, in that transition, just let me get this right. Well, first of all, like what purpose would you say in moguls is the pole plant uh, making? Cause I know some people like maybe mistake is they rely on it so much to block them. Like maybe do you want to uh -huh. speak about a, a blocking pole plant versus like another effect or outcome of a good, like a, a, a smoother bump, bump skier? So, yeah, it would be more of someone planning at the end phase of the turn. So kind of the shape middle turn coming into the end of the turn, but plant too early. So they'll kind of block that uh, absorption phase so as the moment ski should be pressing up they make kind of a down movement with the shoulder and pole plant and they block kind of that natural absorption phase um, and you really want that you know that transition to always be on the back side or after the top of the moment so you know you don't want to plant until the top because that's where uh, the, transition the transition is. Yes. And that's the other thing I, uh, I, I see a lot of people do frequently at all levels of mobile. Um, they reach too much for the plant or they reach too much for the point of pole plant instead of, I like to think of it as like a cylinder of keeping your neutral position and waiting until your body gets to that point to plant instead of reaching out of that, that cylinder to get to the point. So, and e even though, uh, that's like, uh, I, yeah, totally agree with that. Like keeping this, like waiting for the whole cylinder to get to the, the transition point, but, uh, it can maybe be, um, deceiving when you watch really good bump skiers, like sometimes, and you see them, it looks like they are reaching. But would you agree when, if that's ever happening, their whole entire body, the cylinder is being pulled with the reach? Would that be a fair thing to say they're not reaching ahead or and, and out of the cylinder? It's, it's the cylinder is almost coming with the pole plant yeah. reach look. Yeah, we could call it like projection of body or projection directed by kind of the pole plant. Because yeah, you don't, even though you want to stay in that cylinder, that cylinder has to have projection into the hill. It can't be a, a you know kind of that static because eventually you're just going to fall, fall behind. So, you know, I it's kind of a, a term that we've just developed uh, as you know you, when you leave them alone, you project your cylinder, project your neutral towards the next model and it's hard for people to you know it's not like diving into it it's, it's exactly like an old school projector you know putting out the, the film onto the thing it's kind of throwing the picture from the small point and going to the big screen yeah yeah not not and just to clarify you were saying it's not like you're diving which is almost like leaving your feet behind it's it's actually taking everything like a broad jump almost exactly yeah exactly. yeah that's that's the same in in, in surfing I've, I've just taken up surfing the last couple of years recently and 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 that's what they teach you to do to get back up the wave they like the 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 surfers lift and project everything up the wave like like a broad jump so i think it's in a, 
it's in a lot of sports that pr- projection thing. Um, yeah, so that's that's cool. Um, so I think what I've realized is, is a good clarification is like the point of the transition, I think people probably place in the first place too too far back. Like, like they're trying, cause they're all like worried about control. So they're like finishing sort of like not on top of Mogul, like on the, on the face they can see. So their transition is already too like, it's not, they're not waiting long enough. So then their pole plan is too blocky too early yeah. so everything needs to be shifted later and it needs to sit on that on the on that peak part almost when you're coming to the to the back side of, of the bump that transition point yeah and uh, it, you know you did point on you know how people kind of stay sitting in that trough or kind of go into that defense motion and you have to think again of that multi-direction you know, you know, it's just not keeping your feet under you for and out. And a lot of people will come into the mall road, let's say it's a, a right footed turn, we'll call it, you know, left left turn. People yep, speak right about footed turn. ways. Yeah, yeah. No, you can do it. Uh, the skiers, the people here are skiers, they'll know right footer. Yeah. So a lot of times they'll take the, the left side of, of their pelvis and they'll absorb in a, instead of keeping the, the hip level and absorbing with it in a, a level plane they'll drop the inside hip lower and, and have a deeper absorption on the inside point and that will get you inside and back as as often as just for and at the position, hip position yeah that's really so interesting I, I call too. it a so i call it like a soft hip you know it's like you know don't don't let that inside hip get soft you don't want to lift it, but you definitely don't want it to kind of melt into the inside of the, the arc of the turn. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So that's, you would say that is when you get athletes coming through, that's probably one area you have to spend some time coaching and helping, helping them with a lot of people. I'm, I'm guessing it's natural to, to go soft and let that inside half of your pelvis drop. Uh, all level of skiers. Uh, okay. Kind of a key point. Yeah. Okay. Jumping to like, then the very best. Uh, I think I asked you last time who your favorite or who you thought was the best uh, technical, like turns and absorption, not tricks and stuff like that. That part of mogul skiing on, on the World Cup at the moment. Is it still the same person? I won't say who it is. Who, who's your favorite at the moment? Well, I hope it's the same. <laughs> I don't think I've changed, but it's Ikuma. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And and right. what was what was the reason? Why do you think? Like, what do you uh, admire out out of his technique and his his style? Uh, even just watching the first uh, three events uh, in December, uh, just the the consistency. No matter how difficult the course is and how how hard the snow is, how the spacing with the far apart ones or short ones. Just everything we're talking about right now, he 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 strives to do it in the right direction, using the nose of his the tip going into the point of entry, the timing of the absorption extension. You know, this year, actually, we were just talking about kind of that soft hip on the inside. You know, I've, you know, I've seen he has a few incidents where he's a little bit softer on that inside hip um, than in years past. But, you know, that's, he's, for me, when you're in the high-level competition, even if you're watching a World Cup Alpine skier in Solomon, um, adaptation at that level, it's so important. But... At the same time, we don't want to make or copy it because it's so easy to to look at it as like something, oh, that's going to help me. But it's better to stay in a kind of a strict line of fundamentals as, you know, let's say a, a, a skier developing or be technically training and don't do adaptation into yourself. Uh, it's, it's something that Miles will do and skiing high speed and aggressive, but, you know, 
you don't, you don't want to mimic those those things that uh, the top level skiers sometimes use. Yeah. So on that, again, like putting you in this uh, pretend role of like head of making moguls the new booming snow sport, would you would you really be encouraging people to spend time? doing drills because I don't think, I think a lot of people like taking say, Oh, they listen to this podcast and they get this concept of maybe this not soft tip thing. And so they just go and think about it instead of like going to the flats, getting out of the moguls and like say doing some, some like inside ski lifter drills or a javelin drill. And like, like how much do you think that is actually important in the process? Um, well, I think it, certain times of the year i mean every, all of us get out at you know obviously in australia it's a different time than north america uh, northern hemisphere but you get to ski area maybe you get some miles in the first four weeks and it's really boring and you don't have a lot of terrain open those are the times to really like make it interesting and maybe you know, apply uh, different different uh, training techniques just to keep it interesting for yourself and prepare you for when, you know, you don't want to slow down if it's a you know, perfect day, middle of season, you don't want to be, you know, going with the groom, you want to be, you know, putting the fresh powder. And then as the day progresses and it starts turning the moguls, you already want to have kind of your, your foundation there and just enjoy the day. Cause that's, I think the goal of most skiers out there. Is yeah. Great not point. Not making it work. Point. <laughs> yeah 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 I, I think that's a that's a really good point uh, i would say skiing in australia has taught me that because we get probably more days that are less than fantastic go and rip it up so you just learn to find enjoyment and challenge in in doing like drills and different tactical sort of trainings like that um yeah so i think that you know throughout a season there's always days that are less than you know, I think North America is having an amazing start now. So I don't think there's many people doing drills. They're all skiing powder, but, but there'll be a time when maybe you get some melt freeze and, and that's a great time to, to make it interesting with, with drills. And, and you'd, you'd say though, they, it always pays off, doesn't it? Doing drills and exercises. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. What would be your experience? What would be your favorite drills then? Like, do you still do if you're like, oh, I'm not maybe in the in the groove here? Are there any drills like your top two that you go, okay, I know if I do these, I get the feeling back. Um, I, or maybe I, were there, or maybe maybe not now. Yeah, I've done, were yeah. there? One that you know, I, I it's not a drill necessarily, but it's on a. Uh, you know, let's say I'll come with a wider stance and I'll do it with short turns, medium turns, it doesn't matter, but it's again, right foot turn, just kind of clearing the knee, like moving that inside knee first and then driving the ski so that you kind of, without, you know, when you use that inside knee and kind of just tilt it onto the edge and then it's just so much easier to make that initiation. That's kind of been my go-to for the last 10 years, but I'm, you know, I'm, I haven't been doing mobile training for so long, uh, <laughs> I, but I still do those different concentration um, uh, things on the, on the groom that I know it's, it's going to help me when I get to the mobiles and using different stances in, in my groom scheme to making sure I'm you know, just in you know, a shoulder width, I go you know, shoulder, hip, tight stance, like with Peter Gould. I play with it in the run. Yep. You know, top to bottom, I've changed my stance many times. So, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And the other thing I would say, holding neutral. Um, again, it's not a drill, it's just something that I focus on. So, making sure I maintain angles because I think I'm. A lot of people, they lose that neutral position and moguls, you really need to make sure that that ankle bend and knee bends and has kind of a stopper to it. You don't extend beyond that point. So you constantly have kind of that pressure of the tongue of the boot kind of pressing onto the, on the, on the, 
on the forefoot on the top of the on the top of the lower part of the boot. Yeah, those angles that, are important. Yeah, that's probably uh, I um yeah I, I just on that. So so the, that that neutral position is not neutral as in like oh just chill out. It actually takes work yeah. to hold the neutral position, doesn't? And and when you say people often lose it. The first place they probably lose it is the ankle tension is gone, correct? And right. then, and then things like then the hip maybe right, like like the hip unbends and maybe kind of you just stand up a little too straight, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so with keeping that tension, it's more than just like resting on the front of the boots, isn't it? Like, do you want to do you want to maybe just speak to right. the the tension feeling that's more than just resting on the front of the boots? Yeah, well, it's again, it's it's not like a let's say you come to a stoplight, stoplight is red or green or whatever, yellow. You know, it's it's kind of not like on off on off. It's something that um, it's kind of like a dim light, and then it gets harder and harder, and it gets brighter and brighter, and then it's not like the lights off. It's just a constant adjusting of that pressure and making sure that it's never red or green or on and off it's just a, a constant I mean, that's a good analogy different parts of, different parts of the turn you really have to you know not turn the light off to stay like those like <laughs> you know last turn 10 turns i felt my shin of my boot no you have to go back and it's like at turn one through the whole phase and turn which part did I feel like maybe you know, lights off or maybe yeah. the next turn it was red because I was powerful and a lot of pressure on the shin and the boot in the shape middle of turn, but there's nothing at the end of the turn. I'm completely off. So you have to really pay attention to the whole turn to you know, understand that neutral position and where it's delivering its, its uh, pressure on I'm the shin the boot. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me if this makes sense, but it's almost like the, the, the feeling would be in, in that mogul athletic neutral stance. If, if I could come down as a big giant and pick you up, picking you up in the air, you wouldn't unfold. You'd stay still flexed up, right? Like, whereas a lot of people, if someone it's picked them up, they actually unfold. Exactly. You could be in, yes. yeah, okay. You could be in outer space. You could be in midair. The stance looks exactly the same as you are compressed on the top of yeah of, of a piece of snow. Correct. Yeah, that that is a good analogy. A good way. To yeah. Do okay. Yeah. Getting into equipment again. What mm -hmm. what could I do, and what could other people do with boots? And think about boot choices. What makes moguls easier when you're choosing boots? Um, well, it, it's, uh, when we, we work with a lot of, um, let's say different kind of, uh, flex, flexions of boot, you have different tongues that you can use, especially in the full tip. Um, but, you know, I would say in general, you, you, you want a boot that it's, doesn't collapse like you don't feel like the the ankle angle is just you know kind of folding in to, to no tension but as important you don't want to rebound because a lot of of you know stiff boots you can't get any flex out of the forward and then if you do put a lot of pressure it takes a lot of a body weight Let's say your you know upper body into the position to get that that flex, and the rebound is much sharper. You, you want to find a boot that doesn't have kind of that strong rebound, and it allows you to kind of get a, let's let's say a, a flex into the into the of foot at the top of the foot without collapsing. So yeah, that's. I think you know that soft boot. Oh, sorry. I was, I was just saying that makes now total sense with the problem of you're absorbed, don't extend too quick. If you have a boot that 
springs you back, it's going to be harder. It's probably going to pop you out whether you like it or not. And, you know, I, I think it goes to the skier itself, um, you know, how powerful they are, the weight of the skier. Um, and, you know, if, if you really think it's special about it, you might want to change kind of where you're, you're adjusting the cuff of the boot, you know, how, how much forward uh, angle or using wedges behind uh, the liner into the boot, like how, how much are you forcefully pushing in? And I think that's so personal. Um, you know, mm. if, I, if I went into that, it would, I think it would get too technical. <laughs> but people can so, play with those different things. Yeah. So it's not a matter of like a blanket rule. Hey, more forward lean will make you a ski moguls better. Like, like, and can you speak even from experience? You know, of there's quite a varying degree of angles in the top like ten athletes in on the World Cup. Was that would that be fair? For sure. For sure. Okay. Wow. Not all of them have super steep forward lean. Some no. of them. Oh, can you give an example? Do you know who has more of an upright boot? Um. I can't say exactly, but you know, I, I, it's it's one of those things that you really have to be coaching them to get, really get get into it and see what what their position is. Because when you see these guys outside, they're you know the ski the ski boots covered, the cuff is definitely covered by the ski pants, so you really can't. But you get a feel that some people have more of an up you know, position. I would say, in general. Um, Scandinavians, um, they seem to have a little bit more of an upright uh, cuff to the boot. Canadians pretty much have more of a, an angle. And Japanese, I would say, they pretty go uh, off the shelf kind of <laughs> position on, on their boots. Yeah, okay. And so, like, it, say if you were speaking to the the higher and bit like even say myself and I'm like, right, Steven, I just really want to get like way better. I want to ski. Like I'm going to Deer Valley. I actually am going there and I'm going to ski the, the world cup run. Like how should I set up my boots better? Am I going to find it easier with a little more forward lean? Uh, sorry, uh, ramp angle. So like inside the boot, the boot board having more forward lean or again, it is personal. Yeah, um, I would, I would stick to personal, and, and mm -hmm. if you get a, a, a inner where you're ramped up, that can actually create difficulties because as your skis is causing flex, it might, you know, you definitely don't want to be flat footed. You definitely want to have kind of those muscles in your feet moving on on the insole. But you know, if you get yourself into this uh, tippy toe into almost force position yeah force position i think it'll be uncomfortable if you're skiing with the tip of the ski the nose and ski correctly as it enters it's just going to kind of make you feel like you're eject you know ejecting forward um, off position cool but, yeah, again that being flat not being good too you definitely want to be somewhere in that middle yeah, and I so would say probably, most ski boots are the, off the shelf or in that middle. In that middle, yeah, okay. And you're probably gonna, if you were experimenting at all with that, you, you would feel it in the sense what you said. If if you're up to playing with that nose of the ski, if you were experimenting with a ramp angle, you'd feel feel how that would affect the um that interaction. Okay, cool. Do you think that shorter poles make a difference? Do you think that if if everyone's going to go out mobile skiing, they should try and ski with shorter poles? Or is that not totally necessary? Uh, no, not no. That that's very uh, specific to kind of event competitors. But I would, uh, I would, uh, I use myself. I use kind of a adjustable. You know, I have a pole that can go from from one hundred to one twenty, and that, you know, it's there's so many light well-ended different length poles 
and when I'm free skiing and different parts of the moon, I like to change the length of my pole. Um, if I'm in a really, let's say, specific mold course, I, I still stick to not, not a competitor length, but more a comfortable length. For me, you know, I'm, you know, 173 centimeters, and I'll, I'll stick to probably a 105, 107. 105, and 107. Mold skiers take a, a lot of yeah, my height, but a lot of mold skiers, they're pretty, pretty short poles. They're like a so hundred. Something that you do, <laughs> yeah, like one hundred, yeah. one hundred, somewhere ninety-eight. So, wow. But that's yeah. for me. That's that's more of a, a aesthetic kind of fool the, the judges than let's say something that technically helps them. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, I, I, we're we're running out of time here. I just had a, a couple more questions. The one sure. uh, I want wanted to ask you about is the modern mogul field now compared to back when everyone had straight skis and i would say people that come from that era and era would say it was more round moguls were formed now with wider skis people can't get edge to edge the turns kind of extended you're seeing more of these like long upside down canoe shaped moguls where it's like you're on a mogul and then it's like three meters seven feet or something before you are finding the next bump instead of half that length are there some things people could think about or work on technically, tactically as well to make that more enjoyable? Yeah. Um, I'll just go back to hinter touch. I mean, we're doing some um, natural mobile skiing and it was shaped by public and alpine and everyone skiing together. And, um, I, I say, learn how to go through different snow points or snow conditions so you, a lot of times people try to let's say follow the canoe the whole way and the, the line changes and they just stick in that line and you you kind of want to choose your line and you want to go after let's say those powder pockets that kind of soft section of snow you want to go after um kind of like cross rut where you're not going with the rut, but you're actually crossing into it. And you, you can, it's more about reading your line and then continuing to read forward because a lot of times people decide their line and they'll, they'll leave, but they just kind of get stuck in that immediate, you know, well, well I had this 10 meter section planned out. But then they get to that 10 meter and they're like, oh, look up and then everything goes white and they have no idea what to do. So you have to kind of make your plan for, let's say, that 10, 12, 15 meter. Uh, and then as you start skiing, you just like we just talked about pressure. You can't just be uh, passive. You have to renew your vision, renew your line every couple of meters. Renew look further and see where I do to yeah, see where you, your new line is going to be. You know, so uh, as you come over, let's say a pitch where you can't see the mullets behind, you know, don't wait until you get to that pitch point, then decide your mind. As you get closer, you're going to be able to start seeing two more moguls, three more moguls, et cetera, et cetera. So make that mind and, and use all parts of the mogul. Um, and before the prog uh, we started taping, we were talking more you know, about it's not one term per mogul especially in you know, natural models, you, you definitely want to learn how to, let's say, keep the tension, you get to, let's say, a top and the backside of a model. And then you have the ability to, you know, maybe do a transition on the backside and maybe do a, a, an extra turn or an extra two turns and re-enter. An another, um, good training point is kind of that reverse trough so like i said cross trough you know yep. trying to go to the to the, the corner opposite way and when you see moguls go to those corners and the opposite points and that gives a, a lot of good experience so you feel more confident so you're not just always stuck in that on a carbon copy one turn the whole way yeah and, and that, because that's what happens. I think a lot of people, 
if they don't know much about moguls and line, they think, well, everyone else has gone here. And then that's why that canoe upside down canoes formed. So the first thing would be like, actually, you don't have to follow that. You can turn back on top of the canoe, kind of go down a little bit, come back on top of it again, like yeah. several times and then look for, and look for another one to, to cross. Yeah. Like cross rut kind of hit the mogul. So yeah, it's, it's not intuitive, is it? it be, but actually it will feel often you're on better snow and it, and it can lead if you, if you have the athletic position, right. It's easier. I, I just maybe to make it easy to understand when I ski in a mogul course, I'll follow the line people are skiing 98% of the time. When I'm skiing natural moguls, public moguls, natural mogul, I probably follow the line that's in front of me 20%, 25% of the time. Cool. It's, you know, you know, of course, you go to Japan, they have the ski instructors and they'll make kind of that long line. And even there, um, as we talked earlier in the broadcast, we're not, we're taking different points, you know, the high line, middle line, lower line. And, you know, you just don't, you don't want to get stuck into one very, very tight turn. You want to have as, as many variations as you can. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen this. There was this guy I saw, a Japanese bump skier, and uh, Ryu, I can't remember his last name, but he he was doing, in like a rut line, he was doing one, two, three turns in each, da, 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 like 15 times in a row. I, I had to record it slow. Do you know, you've seen it? Yeah, Yuji Yu, which, yeah, yeah. I saw it. Yeah. yeah like that how how would i get to that point of turning that fast with your feet do you just like do you just keep practicing like i would love to do that well that, that was a parody almost he was joking he was doing it for kind of a you know yeah just for an instagram the only thing you, yeah um but for him what was amazing about that was just keeping that neutral and it was all you know knowing when to let the absorption finish and then just being super fast on kind of you know he ended up blending a lot of those transitions but you know it was just it's it's definitely back to that cylinder making sure that the foot alignment hip alignment shoulder alignment he, he's just perfectly balanced that whole way yeah it was cool it was very cool it was very cool cool well steven i really appreciate your insights and i hope it is you, Tom. In, yeah encourage some people that maybe don't ski moguls much to maybe get out there and realize there's some things that just things they're missing like maybe in the choice of ski what they're doing with their boots that how they're tactically approaching it that would make moguls a lot of fun because the like, you know, the people that like, like most, it is, it is fun. I'd rather almost ski moguls. Powder is probably the only other thing I'd prefer, but I, I, I love skiing a good bump field. Yeah. And, and for me, I, I want to be the first one down that, that, that fresh snow uh, in the morning, but there's so much uh, good skiing to be done that late afternoon, or let's say as it snowed for three days. And then you start getting that mix of, powder and, and mogul and that's where i think people can really enjoy you know, the mogul is just increasing their their time and in, in the good snow you know not on the the groomers it's totally. good powder to be found late late to, in the day or you know a few days later yeah it's not as yeah. clean we'll mess yep up. yep excellent but yeah thanks so much again and I hope people got a lot out of that.